Hello, I'm Richard Lawson, the Chief Critic at Vanity Fair, and I'm your host for today's Half Hour with The Queen's Gambit. And I'm so excited to be joined by two of the actors from the show, Moses Ingram. Moses, hello. Hi, how you doing? And Thomas Brody Sangster. Hello. And then the Queen's Gambit casting director, Ellen Lewis. Ellen, hello. Hi. And hair and makeup designer, Daniel Parker. Hello. So before I get into asking all four of you, who I believe are all Emmy nominated, congratulations, um, about the show, I just wanna you know, give a little background for anyone watching this who has not seen the show yet. Uh, the Queen's Gambit is a Netflix series that uh, you know critics like myself have praised uh, for its really in-depth, um, moving look at a one woman as she moves through decades of the middle of last century uh, and as a chess champion. Uh, and Moses and Thomas play people that our hero heroine meets along the way. Um, and it's just a really dense, uh, but in a good way, um, playful, thrilling kind of series that's kind of like a sports show but about chess. <laughs> so Moses, I wanna start with you because, um, and again, congrats on the Emmy nomination. Um, but you play such an interesting character on this because you kind of, your character Jolene really bookends the series. Um, and I'm curious as an actor, how you approached kind of filling in the blanks of Jolene that we don't see on screen so that she can feel as fully fleshed out as she does when we see her again in the last episode. Yeah, I think that was the most important thing to me. I think no matter like how much anybody, you know, sees of any character, I think it's the responsibility of the actor to present a full person. And so I think the biggest part of that for me was making memories. Like I love to like imagine like this whole backstory and things that happened in college and while we were apart. And so then when we get together and you know, I see her, I sort of just like input things <laughs> that I made up on my own time. And yeah, I mean, when, when Jolene comes back into the scene, it just feels like, I felt like I was seeing an old friend, you know? So I think that's really <laughs> a testament to how textured your work is and especially with Anya Taylor-Joy who plays the lead role. Um, yeah, so it was, and I'm curious, Ellen, um, in terms of casting, you know, in, in some cases you're working with, you know, uh, younger actors that, who were then played by older actors, you know, the same character. What were the particular challenges of casting a project like this or, or what were the particular kind of pleasures of it? Well, I mean, the pleasure of it is getting to work with Scott Frank. I was lucky enough to work with him on Godless and, you know, to be able to work with Scott again was a gift. Um, and this was such an interesting piece and it was evolving. I mean, the, the show ended up shooting in Berlin. And so we, I was also working with Kate Sprantz here in New York, who was my partner on this, but also Olivia Scott Webb in London, because as I say, um, when, the, when they moved the show to Berlin, we needed to have somebody based in London. And Olivia is a very talented casting director. And then Annalena Slater, who was based in Berlin. So it was very sprawling. Um, the choice of the fact that Moses was able to do both of the ages was fantastic and a gift. And then it was certainly challenging to cast the younger versions of Anya, of Beth. Um, and so that was something that we spent quite a bit of time on. Um, I mean, everything in casting is always a challenge. So when people, but it's also thrilling and it's a discovery and it's, um, when you have a director like Scott that you can collaborate with and feel a connection to and his openness to ideas. Uh, that's what every casting director is looking for in a director, so. Well, before we go on, I think we should see Moses, we should see Jolene in action. Uh, so we have a clip of that that we're gonna play now. I know how you lost to Benny Watts in Vegas and then beat him in Ohio. I read the papers. Even on a group trip in the town, I spent my ice cream money on a damn chess magazine had your ugly face on it. For a time, that was all you had. And for a time, 
You was all I had. We weren't orphans. Not as long as we had each other. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not your guardian angel. I'm not here to save you. No, I can barely save me. I'm here because you need me to be here. It's what family does. It's what we are. Such a striking scene, you know, for Beth who has been looking for or thinking she doesn't have a community and then by the end of the series realizes she does and obviously Jolene is such a big part of that. Um, also, Benny, played by Thomas Brody Sangster, is, is a big part of that. Uh, Thomas, I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, I'm curious for you because you have so many of these really intense, you know, there's sexual chemistry, there's intellectual competition between Benny and Beth. Uh, what was the working rapport like with Anya? Did, did that kind of just come naturally from the get? Yes. <laughs> Short answer. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd worked with Scott before as well, um, on, on Godless as well. Right. Um, so I, I had a rapport with him, so he kind of knew me. And um, <clears throat> when we first shot, we, we shot everything in Berlin, but we did shoot the first two weeks in Toronto. And so I flew out to Toronto and and he, uh, he was texting me and he was very excited um, because he thought that Anya and I would kind of just work in a very similar way. We were kind of similar as, as actors. And so we, um, he put us in contact with one another and she was upstairs and I said, I'll come meet you downstairs in the bar. And, and we, we actually didn't spend the evening talking about the script or our characters or anything. We spent the evening talking about life and the complexities and the uh, and, the, and, and the wonderful side of acting and, and the whole industry as a whole and, um, and uh, just kind of got to know each other and spoke like normal human beings really. And um, I, I think because of that, we, we realized that uh, we were able to kind of um, see eye to eye quite quickly on, on, a, on, a, uh, on a deeper, more meaningful level than just being fellow actors in a, in a, in a, in a cool new show. Um, and so then when we when we were on set, when we were in character, when we've got our costumes on and we've got our bravado and our and our character's ego in full swing, we were able to we were able to really um, play and bounce off each other. Um, and that was uh, it was when you've got a good actor opposite you and a good script, it, um, it's easy. It, it, it's 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 quite kind of laughable how easy it is. Everything just kind of falls into place and you can you can experiment and you can play and then if you've got a great director which we did he'll then pull you back and pull you back into the scene and um it just becomes a wonderful creative juicy lovely artistic flowing thing and uh, that's when that's when you know that a scene is uh, magical well, let's see a little of that magic. Uh, we have another clip uh, this time of Thomas Brody Sangster as Benny and Anya Taylor Joy as Beth. I read about your game of board golf. That must have felt terrible. I felt like a fool. I know that feeling. Helpless. It all goes and you just push wood. Who have you got up first? Ben Freddy. That shouldn't take too long. Highest rated players in the whole country. And yet here we are in some second rate university playing on cheap plastic boards with cheap plastic pieces. I mean, if this were a golf or a tennis tournament, we'd be surrounded by reporters as opposed to whatever these people are. You should see the places they play in the Soviet Union. I'm planning on it. You have to get past me first. I'm planning on that too. Among many other things, this is a great hair and makeup scene <laughs> that we just watched. Uh, Daniel, I'm curious what your approach to styling these characters was. I mean, was it, you had to be period specific? Was that the, the main focus or was there something else about the characters you were trying to tease out in, in the way that they're, you know, they looked? I, I think with all my work, I try and actually create characters with the actors. Uh, there are certain things that I say, well, that are script led. Certainly with Anya's look, 
in my head when I read the script, she was always a redhead. I know in the book she's not. Um, and also Anya and Scott also said she was a redhead. So that was kind of like a given. Uh, with Moses, uh, she had three great looks. I mean, I mean, it, all the actors I have to say, the, the fabulous performances. I mean, it, the whole thing was absolutely fabulous with a, with a great director. Uh, what Moses did was amazing because she actually took her character through three stages of her life. Um, and so all that was fun to do. Uh, and Thomas, I've got to speak about these guys because they're here um, <laughs> and want to speak about them. Thomas, we had to push this beard out somehow. <laughs> out of it um and uh it's because he was kind of his character was kind of like new york kind of cool beatnik um but i have to say i mean every single character that we did was and that i designed was very much in period um and then also a period before so they came from you know, this is takes place in the 50s and 60s, but they came from the 30s and the 40s. And so you build on that character and it's and you give them a history uh, to put them into the period that we were in um, so that they weren't, they were real. They weren't, they didn't, no, no one was stereotyped for the period we were shooting. They came from another period too. So the whole thing was quite complex, but enormous fun to do, I have to say. Uh, all, all the makeups were great fun. Moses, did you find any one of the ages easier or more accessible? Was there one of the age ranges that you felt like was you could kind of connect to more uh, than the others? Um, it was probably the younger one. Um, just because um, I feel like Jolene has an essence of something that I'm older Jolene has an essence of something that I feel like I myself am still trying to tap into. And I feel like I still sometimes feel very much in that weird in between place of like, you know, especially like now where I am in my career, right? Like I wear like tennis shoes, but like it's like, oh, I gotta walk in heels in front of people. <laughs> like a different story, you know? So I think I think I felt closer to in between team. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I think we all feel that way probably forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Ellen, we, you know, we're talking about the, the challenges and the pleasures of, of this casting process, but I'm curious just because I don't, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, I don't know a ton about casting the profession in general. I'm, I'm curious like what these days with, well, COVID things and distance and all that, like, how has that how has that evolved? I mean, are you able to reach much further to find people than you were in the past? What is actually an odd blessing through the the difficult time of the pandemic is Zoom. And I really enjoy meeting actors in person and having them come into the office and uh, you know, getting to see people in person. Obviously we are not doing that now, but we're able to do it through Zoom. So you are still able to connect and talk to somebody and uh, find out how their lives are and then read and work with them if you need to. So oddly, um, yes, I just worked on a movie where I cast a lot of it out of Texas, all over the entire state of Texas mm -hmm. and Atlanta and different places. And I was able to Zoom with people and meet them all in that way. Thomas, I'm curious when when, when you came to this project, obviously you, you'd worked with Scott Frank before. What else kind of appealed to you about Benny or about the world of the show? I mean, to me, you know, f having followed your career from, you know, since you were pretty little to now, this feels, the, the role of Benny feels like a different one. There's something a bit more maybe grown up about him, even though you start the story younger. Um, so I'm curious like wh how you kind of, uh, what the appeal was for you about doing this project beyond you know the obvious wonderfulness of, of your collaborators. Yeah, he, he definitely had a, um, a, a sense of more of a maturity that I hadn't really had the opportunity to tackle um, because I've always just looked a lot younger than I am. And so it was really nice to um, to play with that um, and to experiment with, with with someone that is 
also a bit of a renegade and, and chooses to stand out um, as a kind of kind of part of his arsenal as well. I mean, I think he uses that to intimidate in his game. And I think he um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a little bit of an intimidator, but I think he does it with a, like a wry wink in his eye. I think he's a little bit of a flirt. And I think he's also, um, uh, I think he also has a kind of a vulnerability that perhaps he, he masks with his bravado mm-hmm. and um, that, but that's in the writing really, isn't it? Um, so it was, it was very fun to play what I thought was a cool character. I don't often play like the cool one, um, but yet it still be um, very much feel, very much feel like a real um, fragile human being. I think he was cool. <laughs> I think I think he, he was definitely off. cool. But yeah. it was it, like the, often often the cool guy is also a bit boring. Um, right, he's not yeah. boring. So there was more depth to him. I, I I like playing depth. I like the depth in people um, and what sets us apart from one another and what makes us all the same as one another. Um, and cool people are often not interesting enough. Part of that depth is because we spend many years with these characters. Um, and I'm curious, Daniel, from from your approach on things like was because you know this there there aren't people you know walking around with like stage old age makeup you know obviously that's not happening but how did you approach like the subtle aging that happens across the the span of this series? Um, I I love doing subtle makeup for starters, but I have to say I had great two actually great actors to work with because the way they moved and the way they behaved. Uh, they they were both actually bloody brilliant uh, because they moved like kids when they were kids and they moved like adults when they were adults. The whole thing just worked. I was just there as a kind of like a, a some kind of prop guy to help them do their character, uh, kind of props of the hair and the face. Um, but I also did give them and the characters, I gave the characters of Beth all these different hairstyles um from this very straight cut then and, and and just growing her into adulthood and growing her into glamour and the world that she was going into but at the same time trying to keep a character uh together and a sensible growth um and the same with jolene um it's a great shame the, the the middle stage of jolene we see it for one shot it was well it was such a, a lovely hair hairstyle that we did it was it was gorgeous um but then of course you see her with the big afro and it's kind of like, hello you know <laughs> fantastic and you made them into where they came from and you took them along in the story uh and that's that's part of my job that i really really enjoy um, helping the characters grow i, I love it it's a period piece, you know, set in a very, um, you know, an era known for a, a kind of distinct style. Were there any kind of cliches of that that you wanted to avoid, Daniel, in in crafting these these looks for the characters? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. In fact, to be honest with you, I wanted to embrace the periods, yeah, very much so. And I wanted to, I wanted to give it a lot of glamour, but I also wanted to kind of like kind of cash in on the beatnik hippie side. I wanted to cash in on stuff. Uh, I did an enormous amount of research. Um, uh, and and it, it went from everywhere from New York to Moscow to Paris. And it was very much also creating all of the characters so they look correct for the period uh, within their environment um, and within their period, within the time uh, and where they came from in America or Paris or wherever. And so that it all made sense. But th- that was part of the fun of it because um, a, every part of the world actually looked and still looks completely different if you really look. And it's those subtle differences that actually make it work. And I think that's one of the things that made it work for us. Um, and it was great fun to do, to, to do these differences. Um, it, was, it was, yeah, um, so it was, all to do with period and place. Moses, did you learn anything playing, you know, a character from the past? I mean, you know, there are some specifics that Jolene mentions uh, in the last episode about, you know, about her schooling and stuff like that. Um, were there any like period details that kind of, I don't know, surprised you when you were making this? Um, no, 
it's a, and all of that is very plain and sort of I think like are things that just grew up you know learning you yeah. know and a lot of that just lives in my skin and in my um I think intrinsically some way they say that you um inherit some things you know um so yeah it it wasn't really surprising no I mean I think that's something I like about this show so much is that you know we've seen a lot of things set in this period but this feels like a different tack on it it's coming at it from from interesting angles and so it feels new while also kind of familiar at the same time it's like a perfect balance I think um and you know uh Daniel Ellen uh, mentioned uh Mariel Heller who um you know is a great film director uh were you involved in her casting as, a, as an actor in this um i was involved in that they've mentioned we lost an actress mm -hmm. and scott called me and said what do you think about mari heller and i was like with the director and he said yeah <laughs> and i'm like i don't know what do you <laughs> she's an actress and he's like yes i worked with her yes i think uh i think she'd be great for this and i just you know i really believe i am definitely opinionated and uh and have a, a strong viewpoint um on the actors that you know i'm talking about for different roles but i also ultimately it's the director's vision and the fact that scott saw Mario very clearly for this, I was like, let's go. I'm with you. It took me maybe a whole episode to realize. I was like, oh, that's Mario. <laughs> it's right. a real, it's a real uh, transformation. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that, you know, we're, we're hoping that people have seen The Queen's Gambit, but in, in case they haven't, um, I think before we close out here, I kind of want to put you all on the spot and ask you to give a very, very short, could even be one word uh, pitch as to, you know, to, to sell someone basically on, on the Queen's Gambit. Thomas, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to start with you. <laughs> sell, sell the Queen's Gambit. Yeah, um, just, you know, the uh, quick, quick elevator pitch. It's a show about mutual respect for one another. There is no bad character. Um, it's about, um, the, the, the demons that live within you as a person and how they are the only things that truly hold you back. And I mean, everyone that surrounds Beth, the lead character in this is actually, is actually kind of rooting for her, even the people that she plays opposite that want to try and beat her. Um, by the end, everyone kind of gathers and galvanizes around her and wants her to reach her full potential as a person. And I think that's a very inspiring, a, a, a beautiful message that the world could do with at the moment. And it's not done in a corny way. It's done in a beautiful, cinematic, artistic way. Um, it's got culture from the past um, in terms of fashion, in terms of hair. Um, and then it's got some bloody good directing, some great script work and some really good acting. Um, it's just quite good. That's that's a that's pretty thorough, and I, I I agree with everything you said. Um, Daniel, do you have a even one word that you you know would say to to convince someone to you know press play on Netflix? I actually just think it's a phenomenal piece of work. But the thing that I, apart from great scripts and great performances, I think it's for me as an artist, it's just the color palette, what we see, and the period, the way it's taken in by the costume, the sets, and hopefully my work too. It's glorious to look at, really. That's what I, one of the things I really love about it. I, I think it, it's a show that forced me to use the word sumptuous, even though I don't <laughs> love using that in my writing, but it really is. I mean, it's a visual yeah. feast. Yeah, the whole um, thing is quite, quite, quite yummy. Yeah, and yeah exciting. exactly. Uh, and and Ellen, I, I imagine you're you you're quite high on the cast. Is that is that what would be your your angle to 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 sell people on the show? Well, I love the cast. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that others seem to love the cast as well. Um, but I would never, yes, watch it because it is a wonderful cast, wonderful actors. But I think it's an unexpected and inspiring journey. 
that you just wouldn't think this is a story about, you know, chess and uh, a young, a struggling young woman. And it's so much more than that. And I think that that's what took everybody by surprise um, and why the response was such an overwhelmingly huge response. People seem to really want to go on this journey and at a difficult time, I think we're very moved by it and kind of comfort and comforted by it. Moses, we'll give you the last word. I'm, I, I'm, I am curious though, like, what what was your reaction to that response? I mean, it was effusive, right? I mean, did, did, did were you able to feel that, you know, while we were all in quarantine? Um, I was actually just saying it was really funny because like, because of the nature of where we were in the world, like it only existed in my devices, <laughs> like yeah. my phone, my laptop, like were insane. But if I closed it up, it was like <laughs> nothing else was happening. So it was this, this strange dichotomy of things, but also very beautiful. And I felt very blessed, um, even in all the turmoil that was going on in the world, to uh, be able to experience an introduction into the business and press, but from the comfort of my own home. So, yeah. Yeah, someday soon you'll have to do in-person junkets, and I and I'm so, on behalf of journalists, I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you all for uh, taking the time to speak with me from various places around the world. Um, again, uh, it's quite a piece of work on all fronts, um, so I hope you're all quite proud of it. And again, congratulations on uh, your Emmy nominations. Um, I want to also thank our friends at Netflix, and of course with our speakers. Uh, and to everyone listening from wh wherever you uh, happen to be, thank you for joining us today for Half Hour With. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.